given our consent to be ruled over. We're given our consent for not our leaders, but men and women who keep their oath to serve us by following the rule of law. And now, Dr. Greg Brandon on the path to liberty. Well, welcome uh, to our second show. Uh, four whole wonderful segments. I was thinking today on my run, what we're going to talk about, what kind of uh, issues today. And on my run today, this is a great time for me to get out there and run, think, pray, was why am I doing this myself, me personally, and what am I trying to accomplish? And when I get done my run, it was a beautiful time, my dog escaped. I have two lovely dogs. My dog Reagan's about three. My dog Riley is about 14. And I figured, how in the heck did our guys get out of the backyard? And it was just the older dog, Riley. So for the next couple hours, I went looking around, looking for my dog, Riley, who I just love. I've uh, 14 years, my running partner, um, a family member. And that's just part of living life. And I looked around and looked around, of course, who found my dog? My lovely wife found my dog. She knew who to talk to and she found our, 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 our dog, Riley. And then on the way over here to the studio today, I get a phone call from my wife because then the two dogs, when I left, my mistake, I left them not in the mud room or not in the back porch, but in the house because they did run away. My wife gives me a call and goes, they ate zucchini and the coffee was all over the house. So here's my lovely wife who has seven kids, homeschools the three little girls, and now she's here cleaning coffee grinds from around the house that the dog decided to play around with. That's life. That's what we all do. We all have those stories every single day. We have to enjoy our life, uh, enjoy the idea of what God's given us with our family, if we have family, uh, or the idea of responsibility, uh, paying our bills. There's all this idea of what living life is about. And that takes me to this, what I'm doing in this process, in this whole political thing. I'd much rather be involved watching the British Open this morning. I, I enjoyed that. Uh, my, my older two children, we are college football fans. We just love it. I love Southern Cal. And the big thing this week around my boy Pete and my daughter Tyler was that um, August of 2016 in Texas, we're going to have uh, uh, Alabama play USC. And for us, it's like, that's great. You know, two power programs for the last hundred years playing each other. It's, um, that's life. That's like, that's the fabric God gives us. He, he doesn't want us to exist. He wants us to taste life, feel life, cry, laugh, be sad, be happy, experience these type of things. That's what's really important. I, we had a, a dear friend of ours this year, passed, this week passed away at the age of 55, who's been a big influence on my children in their life at school, who loved, loved politics, escaped the um, Eastern Bloc, came over here, um, understood God's gift and saw what America can give. It's, this is life every single day. I'm actually a very humorous guy. I joke all the time. I enjoy that kind of life. But right now we're in a time where America, our foundation of who we are is being challenged by our representatives that we put in office. The idea of where America stands in history, America stands in history today, is being challenged because I believe we've lost, we've lost those core principles. We have bread and circuses everywhere to take us away from those foundations because we all want to eat our dessert. We all want to eat our dessert first. But to be healthy and happy and prosperous, we must eat our meat and vegetables first then dessert has its proper place. I think that's what we're losing. We're losing the idea of what made America special, what made the individual special, and that's our creator. When I'm talking about these kind of simplistic things about what we're gonna do this week, talk about our kids. I have a lovely little Gracie tomorrow at four o'clock. She's flying to Ethiopia to go work in the orphanage, which she worked in last year. Uh, that's a big family time. We're excited. We'll pray for her to go over there to not just her to be changed and help change hearts, but the heart that she gets changed coming back and effect on all of us. I really thought in my life right now I'd be a missionary, but I really believe the missionary place we have to do is our home right now. It's very important that we have the opportunity before it passes our time to express 
what life is crucial about. And that's the individual human. That's what makes life special is your neighbor, the person you've not met at the grocery store, who you're going to associate today at the soccer game. Those kind of things, that interrelationship is what's special. But I really believe that's why it's important we understand what our structure of government. See, ours is different than any other government the world has ever seen or has seen in the history or seen today. Every other government is always based upon the collective, what's best for the common good, what's bed for the general will. All those kind of things is what's laid down for the rest of the world. But society is at its best when the individual is at the center and government is the, is the tool for the individual that makes society prosper. That's the idea of free markets, the free exchange of ideas, the idea of, of you may invent a, a better mousetrap. You want to see if the market exposes that. The idea of competition. Competition is not bad. Top competition, true free market competition, lifts all boats. See, American exceptionalism is based upon that. It's based upon not the individual being exceptional. I've had the honor of traveling the world to China, to Africa, to Central America, to Western Europe. I've met great people around the world. They're all exceptional as individuals because they're all made in our creator's image. But America was the only country based upon that as our crux of our civil government our civil government. See, that's why it's important to know why the playing field must be equal at the beginning, not the end. And now we have central planning in every aspect of our life, from our economy, fiat currency, education, health care. Central planning dehumanizes, dehumanizes the individual. And then we have these elections every two, four, six, depending on what the office is, to try to divide us amongst teams, DR, liberal, conservative, all this kind of stuff. The rhetoric, we're going to push aside, we're going to look at the facts, take them back to our foundation, and review that. So that when a government is really doing what it's supposed to do, you won't even care. It won't be there because you will be talking about soccer, about college football, about going to church, about missions trips, about cleaning the dog stuff up. That is living life. See, the government is intrusive that's affecting every part of our life. And we have the answer to help our lives better when the government is in its little box and the represents are chained to it, not being over us. So today we're going to just talk about a couple issues. I really want to spend some time in the next few segments. I'm going to go over the first part about probably the two most important topics you're not supposed to talk about publicly are God and politics. How our country is founded based upon a Judeo-Christian belief, but a civil government, not a theocracy. But everybody has a worldview. Everybody does. And that worldview is out in the... um, public atmosphere is supposed to be there, but there's a structure where we got our foundations. And the other segment I would do is I want to talk about are these things called the sweeping clauses of the Constitution. There are four of them. It's, it's the Supremacy Clause, the Jim Welfare Clause, the Commerce Clause, and the Necessary and Proper Clause. I want to talk what our founders talked about that and how those were meant to chain our agents, chain our representatives, not the individual. We'll go through, through some of those and some of the, the um, discussion they had during our time between the Federals and the Federals. And then the last segment I want to tie together is I'm going to take an example of how when a policy comes outside those change, how it affects our daily life. And that's going to be nationalized health care. I'll spend on Obamacare and go through that in detail. But again, I want you to get to know who Greg Brandon really is, a guy who loves his wife, blessed by God with a wonderful family, and loves delivering babies. But right now, I think it's important we eat our vegetables and meat, prepare as we have our dessert. I thank you very much for this first segment. We'll move on to the next one in a few minutes. Thank you very much.
Welcome back to uh, Constitutional Path to Liberty. I, again, I really appreciate your time. I know how valuable your time is, but to put um, your hard-earned time and effort, effort to actually watch and listen to this, I really appreciate that. God and politics. You're supposed to talk to anybody about anything other than those two subjects. And yet, that's the core fiber of who we are. Who we are, what we believe, and how we act. And I'm, I'm talking really important parts here because our government is based upon a Judeo-Christian belief. And the way a Judeo-Christian belief country acts is really important in the structure because it should never be forced upon anybody. That's why we're not a theocracy. Think about this. Now, our founders were believers. Now, this is I'm a born-again Christian. I want to really walk through this. It's really important. That's a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, accepting him as my Lord and Savior. That is a personal salvation. That is an individual choice. That is not what I'm talking about in the idea that we're based upon a Judeo-Christian foundation. That is his word. But the civil government is based upon that. That salvation is an individual act. Two different things. But there has to be a foundation where that is. A theocracy is when a denomination, a sect, a religion comes in and merges with the government. That public-private partnership would be the worst ever. That is what you do not want to have occur. So think about our founders. They were believers. They may have been deists. They may have been uh, Quakers. They may have been Christians, Catholics. They Even Thomas Paine believed it was structured religion that made them question the force of the government involved here. So these men had a foundation where they raised their families, their wives, and look back at why we, you know, the pilgrims came in the first place was, was religious persecution. They wanted to be free and express who they were. So our founders who believed in a creator did not want the force of government to inflict their beliefs. They want their beliefs to be open in a public environment. Now, on the other side, as a, as a Christian, I don't want, I had, a, I had a meeting with a bunch of pastors last summer during my campaign, and we were talking about the idea of a, a, a person within politics, and we started talking back and forth about stuff and, and how the law should be involved and, and not be involved in certain aspects. And then I asked them a question. I asked them, if Jesus Christ was in the room right now, would he make you, that's the word of you, make you join him? The answer is no. No. It's a free choice to make him, to ask you to join him. So why would you want the power of the government to inflict a certain religion or a certain uh, sect or certain beliefs? It isn't. But there are certain co- there are certain fundamental principles in Judeo Christian beliefs that are there, and the foundations are Ten Commandments. That's why it's important to know our structure. In 1898, in the Holy Trinity case, the Supreme Court looked at over 15,000 documents over our American foundation. They said we are definitely a Christian country based upon our beliefs. When you look at the convention notes. You have verbatim quoted from Scripture over 30%. Then Montesquieu and Locke were quoted down the line. But not even Montesquieu, Locke, and Blackstone, they got their stuff from somewhere too. And it goes back to God's natural law. Again, a constitutional law is not a law unless it's based in God's natural law. So as a Christian, when you hear about this, uh, I, there's a famous verse in Romans 13, 1 through 7, talks about be submissive to the government. It's very important to read what it means. It's for a government to do good. And the moment a government oversteps its bounds, the answer is it does not do good anymore. The individual is superior to the government. See, the individual came before the government. How do you know that? You look at Scripture. The, um, the, the legend is that the Sons of Liberty, Samuel Adams and John Hancock, started their group Sons of Liberty based upon 2 Corinthians 3.17, which says, the Lord is spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, is liberty. uh, 1 Corinthians 7.23 says, men were bought at a price not to be bond servants of men. See, when you look at Scripture in totality, we have to look back at our foundational belief. Now, if one does not believe 
th- thank, thank goodness they're in this country, because in this country you're not forced to. So a bunch of believers put together in our Constitution, Article 6, Clause 3, there should be no religious tests. That's why it's important that we understand the structure of our civil government is based upon Judeo-Christian beliefs to all come partake in the ideas of ideas. Like when Paul was on Mars Hill in Acts, he had no problem going out into the world. to He knew his belief was correct and have that, but not the power of the government. At the same time, you do not lose your political, your, your religious voice in the public square. In the public square, you're free to be wherever you are. You don't get a job and lose the opportunity to speak to read the scripture or not read the scripture. It's your choice. There's a law in 1785 in in Virginia where Patrick Henry, my favorites, actually wanted to actually take tax money to pay for Christian teachers. And Jefferson and Madison said, no, you cannot. That's not part of the job. And Jefferson, in his answer to that, called the Memorial uh, Remonstrance Against Religious Assessments, has 15 reasons why. To go through there, he says, first off is religion does not need government. He says, no need to do that. In one of them, he always talks about, he said, but America, what sect would be more prominent if you start to pick which sect takes over? And then he said, also, we are a, a bastion of liberty. We are supposed to be the lifeboat for the rest of the world. We're going to have, the, we're going to be in a place for asylum. What if they don't meet our religious criteria? No, we, and he was, here's a guy who talked about, God does not need this. We cannot put the government involved. They'll actually mess up true religion. Jefferson wrote the Virginia Act of Establishing Religious Freedom. Now, here's how he writes this. He says, well aware that Almighty God hath created the mind free. He says, it, it, he goes, the holy author of religion who being Lord over both body and mind yet chose not to propagate it by coercion. That's freedom of choice. That's true religion. Then he says, it was the almighty power to do so. But the imperious presumption that legislators and rulers of civil government can do it when the author of creator said he couldn't. See, that's the idea of freedom to choose or not to choose. But the civil government is based upon those core Judeo principles. So he says at the end of it, he goes, be therefore enacted by the general summary that no man should be compelled to frequent or support any religious worship, place or ministry whatsoever, nor shall be enforced, restrained, or molested or burdened by its body, nor shall otherwise suffer the account of religious opinions. He says, uh, and by argument to maintain their opinions in matter of religion, and that the same shall now diminish in larger effect their civil capacities. He said, the legislators, even if the assembly does not say this, they can declare it, but doesn't make it law because they have no power over the individual anyway. God is the author. That's true religious freedom. Now, at the same time is when he became president, uh, his second year in 1802, he got a letter from the Danbury Convention. Well, they were concerned that the that the federal government may have a may have a um, a national religion, and he said no. There would be a wall imp- impenetrable from the government side, not the individual side. In fact, as he was president, that next Sunday he had a Christian service every Sunday in the church in the Capitol Rotunda, and the Marine Band played the Christian music. So you do not lose your religious freedom in the political sphere or in the public sphere express it if you want to or not want to. That's why when you look at our fir- our Bill of Rights, the, f- the first Bill of Rights is the government, the Congress should make no law infringing on religious freedom or expression thereof or establishment thereof. Congress shall not make, not the individual. So I'm very blessed that we're in this fun, wonderful country that understands religious freedom, religious opportunity to understand that's your choice, but our founders, without a doubt, ran to scripture more than any other book to put our civil government based upon God's words. And the base of that is the Ten Commandments. In the next segment, we'll go over a little more of the uh, sweeping clauses. And I really appreciate this time. It's been, um, it's a pleasure doing this work with you. Thank you so much. We 
have to right now in this generation ask a question that our founders had to ask. Who or what is sovereign and what is truly the legitimate role of government? And now back to Dr. Greg Brandon on the path to liberty. Welcome back. Thank you very, very much. In that last segment, I got a little passionate reading Thomas Jefferson's words, but they, uh, the man who, uh, who penned the declaration, um, just gets my passion going because he understood that God's natural law is our foundation of what a true government's supposed to be. We're going to take that. Those who know me, I always go around the world, uh, country or state, wherever I'm speaking about on TV or radio about these two questions. Who is sovereign and what is the legitimate role of government? In the last segment, I spent time talking about the creator, sovereign of the universe, making us in his image. So we're sovereign. That's why our religious rights don't come from any government or a blessing from a church or anything like that. It comes from our creator. End of story. There's no debate. He endows, endows us with certain able rights. That's why our founders after the, in the Constitution had the Bill of Rights and most of the 13 states had the same things. In fact, the North Carolina Constitution, even as of today, it says you must be a believer in the Almighty to even hold office. That's in our Constitution in North Carolina. John Jay said it behooves us to vote for a Christian because we're mainly a Christian country. But it's important to understand though, that is our foundation. But the individual has the choice, not the government. I'm going to go over some ideas now. The second question, what is the legitimate role of a government? We must go back to that paragraph, the second one of the declaration that Jefferson wrote. It says, to secure these rights, which rights, an individual's enable rights, a government instituted amongst men, driving their just powers from consent of the governed. Again, the consent comes from the sovereign, you and me, made in the creator's image. So that is the legitimate role of government. If the government oversteps its bounds, it is now illegitimate. So the Constitution, 11 years later, knowing that's their foundational premise, is that a government must protect the individual liberal rights. Let's see what the Constitution says and how it does it, and how today's people interpreted it the way the anti-federals feared some men would. Again, they're very clear. They did not trust a single man or a group of small men together to centralize power in anything. They feared that. They dispersed it. In dual sovereignty, different governments, we went over the last time, we'll go over that some more. There's a book I'd love you to guys get. The Founding Fathers Guide to the Constitution by Byron McCallaghan. This book goes through the convention notes of Philadelphia and all the states concerning the Constitution. It says what the Constitution says. He goes right to the anti-federalists, right to the anti-federalists who are questioning what they mean, how they implied it, and then the, ant then the federalists are answering them. That's important because the federalists, Hamilton, Madison, George Washington, in this state, Iredell, Johnston, they wanted this contract. So they had to answer to the anti-federals who loved the Articles of Confederation, our first constitution. And this is what Jefferson said. He was in, he was in Paris. He was not even around during his time. But he goes, if you want to know what the constitution means, ask its friends. So we're going back to the intent of the maker, the original intent of the contract. That's important because I don't care if it's one year after the contract, one month after the contract, 238 years, 265 years, it doesn't matter. The contract cannot be living. Then it has no standards and it's useless. It must be a fixed point in time with the contract. Last week, we talked more about judicial review, which is not part of the power it has to do this. But let's go over these clauses again. Very important. The supremacy clause. Article 6, clause 2 of the Constitution says... The Constitution is supreme law of the land in pursuant thereof. So wouldn't we want to know what pursuant thereof means? Very important. It means that if it's not in those six pages, it's not there. In Article 1, Section 8, 
changed the federal government to its functions. James Iredell, in North Carolina Convention 1788, in Hillsborough at the first convention, was asked that question multiple times. And every time he said was, if it's not there, it doesn't count. And I want to quote from this book. This is important. James Iredell, writing as Marcus, if Congress, under pretense of exercising the power delegated to them, should in fact, by the exercise of any other power, usurp upon the rights of the different legislators or any private citizens, the people will be exactly in the same situation as has been expressed in provision against such power. It would be an act of tyranny. Tyranny. James Iredell was appointed by George Washington on the first Supreme Court. So let's go through the Supremacy Clause. That chains our representatives to that contract. The next one is the General Welfare Clause. The General Welfare Clause does not mean whatever the government says it can do for the welfare of everybody. Roger Sherman took it out of Article 3 of the Articles of Confederation verbatim. There's virtually no debate in Philadelphia about this. They knew exactly what it meant. It meant a common defense and to regulate foreign trade. So any tax that's, that's actually raised in Article 1, Section 8, the first clause, is limited to that function. An example, Madison's last day in office as president, Henry Clay had, a, had extra money, believe it or not, called the bonus bill, and they wanted to build interstate highways and canals. Asked Madison off the record, can't, what a good idea, it was a great idea. Clay got a pass, they went through the Senate and the House, got passed, Jeff, uh, Madison, the president, vetoed it. He said, why'd you veto it? I love the idea, but the Constitution gives us no power. We need an amendment for that. See, he was chained to the Constitution. A good idea is not a good idea if it's unconstitutional. And in Article 5, gives us the power to have amendments. I go through many more details in Welfare Clause, but Madison also said, he said, if, it meant, if, if Article 1, Section 8 meant what everyone wanted to say, or the Constitution said we could say whatever we want to say, he goes, why did we enumerate them in 18 powers? Why? He goes, it's actually only controlled by a semicolon. We just list their powers. The next one is the Commerce Clause, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 3. It's only 16 words. It's the federal government will have interstate trade be not hindered to regulate meant to make regular, to be no barriers, to be basically a free trade zone, trade amongst Indian tribes and foreign countries to bring commerce in. That's the Commerce Clause. It was used again to help trade. But yeah, the first time it was used in 1881 where J.J. Hill was building his private railroad and whooping the butt of the centralized, federally funded railroad that they went over, complained about it to the government. The government used that inter the Commerce Clause the first time ever to make J.J. Hill actually increase his fees, which he lost his competitive edge over the federally funded ones. And the classic one of that is in 1942, the, the uh, Wicked Filburn case, where the federal government could literally tell a man on his own property how much wheat he can grow and eat. That is not what the word meant in the Commerce Clause. And the fourth one is a necessary and proper clause. This is where, after Article 1, Section 8, they list the 18 functions. There's actually 17. And the 18 function is necessary and proper. And what that meant was, whatever needs to be done to make that function be done. No more, no less. Example. We have, we have one of the functions is a Navy. Therefore, it would be necessary and proper to have shipyards and harbors. That is what it meant to be, not to imply whatever kind of power you want to go with. Now, we have this book has beautiful examples of articulating through each single one of those. And I'm actually going to read a phrase in the next column when I go over Obamacare in more detail. And I hope I didn't go too fast, but it's important that those clauses chain the federal government not the individual. I appreciate this, but that education is important. Welcome back. I hope you're back for the fourth segment. And again, thank you very much for this great opportunity.
back. I appreciate that. Uh, this last segment, I am going to talk about nationalized health care, but I also want to go back to the process, which I believe we have to is partaking within the power we have as individuals in sovereign states to actually get rid of the over Leviathan of the federal government. One last quote out of Byron McCallion's book. It's on page 82 by Archibald McLean in North Carolina. The, the question was, what do you do if the federal government oversteps their, pow, their, their bounds? And here's what he says. This was at the convention in 1788 in Hillsborough. If Congress should make a law beyond the powers and the spirit of the Constitution, should we not say to Congress, we the states, who have no, you have no authority to make this law. There are limits beyond which you cannot go. You cannot exceed the power prescribed by the Constitution. You are unable to us for your contact, your conduct. This is unconstitutional. We will disregard it and punish you for the attempt. That's the power of the sovereign state saying no to the overbearing of any federal government thing that's not there. I hear both sides today talk about certain unfunded mandates. Some mandates are good. Some mandates are bad. There are no mandates that are good if, if it's not within the Constitution. See, we have people running for office that are going to take an oath in Article 6 right here. Take an oath to uphold this Constitution. Put their hand in the Bible and swear to uphold this and don't even know the chains it's bound to. They don't understand the supremacy clause, the sweeping clauses of general fair clause, commerce clause, um, or the necessary and proper clause. So what do we do if you don't understand? It's like atrophy, right? If you don't use a muscle, you lose that muscle. We've for, so, for the last hundred years of progressivism, we, we've lost the idea of the sovereign individual given their bestowed to the government at the federal level, at the state level to protect themselves. See, there are two governments, dual sovereignty or dual governments as Madison talked about. They have one exact same mission. The mission is to protect the individual's inalienable rights. But they're dispersed. The state has over here its powers, which are whatever the people in the area stay, as long as a republic foreign a government, it's what they decide in that state. They took their powers and gave it over here to the federal government, 18 functions. And within the Constitution, it's broken down with the legislative branch has 33, executive 13, judicial 6. But the main goals are Article 1, Section 8 that limits them. That limits them. So, I may get to Obamacare next week, but let's go over this. So, Jefferson and Madison asked a question. What happens when the federal government usurps its power? What do you do? This word is called nullification. And people freak when you hear that word. I was hammered on uh, MSNBC by Reverend Al Sharpton. Uh, tall, you know, that was poor slavery. I'm going to go through how nullification was used to fight slavery, Mr. Uh, Reverend Al. The first nullification document in America as we united, was the Declaration of Independence. We said, we're cutting our ties with this government because they usurped their power. They're taxing us at a rate that's unacceptable. It's between 1% and 2%. We are free men. We understand what that understands, and all men are created equal. We're done, number one. In 1798, the Federalist Party in power passed a thing called the Alien Sedition Act, which had three laws concerning alien friends, alien enemies, and a sedition act. You could say nothing bad about the federal government. And John Adams actually arrested about 33, 34 people. In fact, uh, of Vermont, uh, Matt Lyons was a congressman from Vermont, was actually arrested, put in jail, and won re-election from the prison cell. But before that, the Federalist Papers are John Jay, Hamilton, and James Madison wrote 85 articles trying to convinced New York the Constitution was the best for everybody. And at number 46, Madison goes through this thing. What do you do when a federal government usurps its power? He went through a couple of delineations what you do. It's the, he, one of them was that the, the, the 
head governor, the magistrate would say, no, the legislation will just be peacefully resist, you know, make resolutions. He walked through the process. So he wrote the Virginia resolution, 1798, and Jefferson wrote the Kentucky resolution. And they wrote it saying, here's the process. You go back to the constitution itself, hold people accountable and peacefully resist. The Bill of Rights protects you over here. There's no power over here in the Bill of Rights, and there's no par- power in Article 1, Section 8, and or Article 6, Clause uh, clause 2. So they went through the idea of how you do that. Now, what was very important was they took that debate out there, and two years later, the 1800 election, the Federalists lost office and never won again because they overstepped their powers. So nullification does not mean to secede. It means to hold the parties, the contract, closer together to make a more perfect union. The Northern, in, in 18, uh, I think 1809, Governor Trumbull from Connecticut actually used it when the federal government was usurping its power concerning um, trade between England and uh, between England or with France. And they thought that, Matt, that they were actually overstepping their bounds. He used it against Madison, saying that the legislative branch of Connecticut must be our duty bound to be protective shields over the state to protect the state. So when I hear people attack nullification about the UC, they, back to, they went back to slavery because Calhoun wanted nullification and Madison said no to that. It's very important to understand this. is 1832. The idea of nullification is that the state itself can say no to it. But Calhoun wanted South Carolina to say no to their trade tariffs for two reasons. I'll get to that in a moment. And Madison said no to him. Because here's why. First off is, the first part of the vacation has to be an unenumerated power. The power to tax the tariff is in the Constitution. You debate how high it is, but that is part of the Constitution. And number two, nullification is so Calhoun wanted the South, the South Carolina, its opinion goes to every other state. That's not what Madison said. So what Madison said was the individual state can make a decision upon that and say no to something and overstep their bounds. They cannot, the state cannot say no to a enumerated power. That's where people start to confuse. They want to you know, laugh at this. But it is, it is because the structure, there has to be a force outside the contract that holds people bound to the contract. And that is the parties to the contract. The classic one is slavery. In 1850, Congress passed a constitutional law that said the Fugitive Slave Act that any white man could take any slave and seize property, bring him back for a, for a bounty. And a, a bunch of northern states said no. That's called nullification. They said no to that. That led to a man named Joshua Glover who um, was in Missouri, ended up getting to Wisconsin, and Wisconsin said he's staying here. The federal government said you must give him back. Congress said you must give him back. And uh, the legislators of Wisconsin and the Supreme Court of North of, of Wisconsin said, no, he's a human being. See, that's what is all about this idea of nullification. It's to understand where the power really is. So what I'm going to use is use this background and this basis for issues in the future. We'll go over next time. We'll go over Obamacare, uh, nationalized education and uh, fiat currency, but understand that we must know our powers within this contract to make the contract binding and applicable today to protect the individual. So I'm hoping you get a little, little more who I am today. Uh, the idea that I really want to sit back and enjoy the family, but I think our mission right now is we must, we must practice these core foundations for future, future generations or else we're not going to have America to pass on to. That's why we're here. I thank you very much for your time. Hope to see you back here next week. Thank you very much to Constitutional Path to Liberty. Thank you. WMYT, my talker radio.